Okay, we're going to talk about, uh, talk about adult chest disorders. We're going to basically stick to part one of adult chest disorders. Tomorrow, I think, is when we do the second part, which deals with some of the really gnarly stuff, like pulmonary embolism, which is really difficult, and we'll talk about that tomorrow. But today, we're going to talk about some of the more straightforward adult chest disorders. And the reality is, not infrequently, yes, indeed, doctor, it is, or, or PA or NP or practitioner, it is their lungs that they're there for. But a couple things are really important about just understanding the chest, as far as things that can go wrong, as far as the adult chest is concerned. First and foremost, we get tons of chest x-rays appropriately. There are a lot of really good things you can get from a chest x-ray. But I highly, highly recommend, and most of you probably already do this, but if you don't, I highly recommend a systematic approach to each and every chest x-ray that you look at. A system, and, I, and Billy just alluded to this, but I also recommend that you look at your own chest x-rays when you order them. Don't rely on a radiologist sitting somewhere in Australia on a sailboat looking at a screen when they've had it zapped to them while they're on vacation. The reality is a radiologist isn't at the bedside, you are. You kind of know what you're looking for, and sometimes you're the person that will find the thing that the radiologist doesn't. I'm amazed how often that if you're thorough, you'll find something that they don't necessarily find. And again, you have the benefit of having been to the bedside. So when you're looking at a chest x-ray, one of the things that's crucial, and it's one of the things that digital x-rays have done wonderfully for us, is first of all, make sure it's a good chest x-ray. Make sure that you, it is, the technique is good. It needs to be square on straight. And you've all seen the sort of portable chest x-ray. that You can't interpret anything from that. What you need to do is make sure it's on straight. And what you're looking for is the clavicular heads being equidistant from the spinous process. Okay, if they're not, if one clavicular head is closer and the other one's kind of out in space, what it's going to do is alter the view of what the heart looks like and the mediastinum looks like. So make sure that the clavicular heads are equidistant from the spinous process on the film. You want to make sure that you actually see the, the spine through the heart on a film. So it's not over-penetrated or under-penetrated. And you can futz with your digital image and make it right. It's wonderful. And you want to make sure that they've taken a good breath. If they take a little eensy tiny breath, you're not going to be able to see some of the things in, your chest, in the chest that you need to see. So position good, good penetration, good breath, down to about the 10th rib. That is a good, technically good film. Now you can actually go systematically through looking at the parts of it. And the thing that's important not to do, just like it's not it's important not to go right for the place that's tender in someone's belly, start somewhere else and get to the tender spot last. I recommend strongly don't go right for what you're looking for instantly with a film. If you think there might be something in the lungs and you go right to the lungs, you may very well miss the fact that they're missing a rib because they have metastatic disease or that they've had a mastectomy. And if you actually look at the film and the soft tissues, you notice there's a whole breast missing. So there are things that you should be looking at from basically out to in. And whatever system you use, I don't care, but use a system. This is just one version. There are a lot of different ways of going about it. But the key is, I think, don't go right for where you think the money is because you'll miss something that's glaringly obvious later. And Greg alluded to this in his medical legal talk. The reality is if it's there and it's not noted and down the line something bad happens, you've missed it. You're part of the, you're part of the problem. You're part of the sort of medical legal net that gets, it gets tossed out there. So chest x-rays, systematic approach, really useful to do. And I think chest x-rays are awesome. I love looking at chest x-rays. Now, the other thing about your lungs, what your lungs are meant to do is basically do two things. One, get rid of the carbon dioxide that you're producing all the time. And the other is to get the oxygen in and to your cells. The way they do that, though, is by having it, it not just diffuse in your blood. It doesn't diffuse in your blood. A little eensy bit, 3%, 5%. Most of it globs onto those four moieties on your hemoglobin molecule and get carried to the tissues where your tissues can use them. What's interesting about that is that you, need, you can get cyanotic, certainly. We've all seen blue people. People aren't supposed to be the colors of Smurfs. They're supposed to be nice and pink. You don't turn blue unless you have basically five grams of hemoglobin desaturated. Now, think about it. Think about a normal hemoglobin. Your normal hemoglobins range anywhere between, oh, say, 10 and 13. If you are anemic, so for instance, normal hemoglobin is where it carries. If you're anemic, you will never get cyanotic before you're dead. So say I have anemia and I have a hemoglobin of five. My hematocrit is 15. I've been having fibroidal bleeding forever. I come in finally because I'm just really, really tired and they find that my hemoglobin is five. I would have to desaturate every single one of my molecules of hemoglobin to turn blue if I am that anemic. I'd be dead first. 
So versus, say I'm somebody who's been a smoker forever, and I have been hypoxic for long enough that my body has made more red cells. Or I live in Peru in the Andes. I'm a Quechua Indian. I live in the Andes. I have a normal hemoglobin, because I live at altitude, of 20. That's my normal hemoglobin. If I desaturate five grams of that, I'll turn blue. Or if I'm a smoker and I desaturate five grams of my 17 grams, that's my baseline, I'll turn blue. But I'm not really hypoxic. Cyanosis is a funny thing. We think it's the equivalent of hypoxia. It really isn't. So if someone is blue, you have to interpret that blue in sort of the light, in light of how, how much hemoglobin do they have. For most adults, if, you desatch, if your hemoglobin is 12, normalish hemoglobin, and you desaturate five grams of that, you actually are hypoxic, and you are basically, that, that's a pretty decent gauge in a normal person. Anemia, they'll never turn blue before they die if they're severely anemic, and hyper, hyper hyperthemic, you know, polycythemic, they'll turn blue and they're actually not hypoxic. So just know that cyanosis is kind of a strange thing. The other thing about your lungs is there is so much more to how we, inter how we sort of interpret somebody's respiratory status than their respiratory rate. You know, Bill, Billy alluded it to, to it in the vital signs thing. You know, every respiratory rate that comes out of our triage department is 20. It's always 20, 20, 20, 20, 20. Baloney, it's 20. So a couple things. Yes, respiratory rate is important, but really look at someone breathe. We had a great case of a raging DKA patient. New onset, 23-year-old kid, came in altered and really sick, and really, really sick. And his respiratory rate was truly, honest to God, 20. But you watched him breathe, he had true Kussmaul hyperpnic respirations, big, huge, deep breaths because he was so acidotic. That, that is equally important and when you're assessing somebody's respiratory status. So not just the rate. What's it look like when they breathe? Is it a big, huge breath? That's important. Is it a little shallow breath? That's important because your tidal volume, your vital capacity, all of that's important in how you do what your lungs are supposed to do, which is blow out CO2 and bring in oxygen. Really important. What tends to drive that is your CO2 level. You could right now hyperventilate. You could sit in your chair right now and on purpose watch your watch, you know, watch your sort of sweeping second hand if you have them or your analog second hand and breathe once every two seconds. What you would do as you blow off CO2, drops and drops your CO2, and then you would, and then you quit doing that really crazy breathing thing, you will not have the urge to take another breath for 30 to 60 seconds because you've blown it off. Your body says, I don't need to breathe right now. You already did it for me. I don't need to do it. I'll wait till that CO2 builds up again, and then I'll breathe some more. That's the main driver of your respiratory status. Now, sometimes it's hypoxia. People who live at a chronically high sort of carbon dioxide level, like COPDers, or OSA, people who have obstructive sleep apnea, or obesity hypoventilation system syndrome is what it's called now, you have to realize they may get a little of this hypoxic drive, but most of the time it's your CO2 level that drives your breathing. So that's basically what, what makes you breathe. Now, blood gases. We, the, back in the day, I did two residencies. I did internal medicine first, I did emergency medicine second. When I was an internal medicine resident, lo these many years ago, I can't tell you how many blood gases I ordered for everything under the sun. Asthma got blood gases, CHF got blood gases. Of course, any ingestion where I was worried about pH got blood gases. The reality is arterial blood gases really have virtually no role anymore in medicine. If you think about what you're trying to get from a blood gas, if I want to know if somebody's oxygenating, I just look at a pulse ox. As long as they're getting blood to wherever that pulse ox thing is, as long as they're perfusing it, that's a perfectly adequate way of seeing if they're oxygenating. That's perfectly adequate. What I really can get out of a blood gas that theoretically I can't get you know, externally is a pH, but honestly, I don't care about the pH most of the time, and a pCO2, which I can kind of gauge both of those from the bicarb on a chem. So there's very little role, honestly, in getting even a VBG, which is what most of us should be getting now, not an ABG. There's no point in hurting somebody and poking them here. It hurts like a son of a gun. It doesn't give you a lot of benefit. They're probably the only roles left are if you really, really, really care about a pH. So that's mainly toxic ingestions. Could someone have ingested methanol? Then I maybe really do care about a pH. But as far as respiratory stuff is concerned, most of the time it's going to be a clinical decision on your part whether you do something, BiPAP or CPAP or intubation, it's not gonna be a blood gas. All the blood gas will do is sometimes confuse you. 
somebody's actually doing okay mental status wise, but the blood gas looks a little scary, it may prompt you to do something when you don't have to do. So overall, blood gases are not terribly useful anymore, and probably the best role is for a pH itself in tox cases. That's the most common. Now, the people will have respiratory failure. That's what we worry about. They come in with respiratory problems. Two, ver two kind of flavors of respiratory failure. One is they can't oxygenate. Okay, so that for whatever reason, they have a pneumonia, they have a, a perfusion problem like a PE, where they can't get the oxygen into the blood because the blood is, the clot is, in the, is a problem. They can get hypoxic respiratory failure or hypercarbic respiratory failure. Often they're overlapped. There's a little bit of both. It's, it's rarely purely one or the other. But for instance, obesity hypoventilation syndrome or COPD, they can absolutely get hypercarbic respiratory failure. We, have, we are a sleep apnea referral center where I work, which means that it is not at all uncommon for someone 400 to 600 pounds to come to our emergency department. Those people, you lay them on their back, you let them go to sleep, they will retain CO2. It's a nightmare. It's absolutely a nightmare. It's a nightmare. They get hypercarbic respiratory failure. It makes them sleepy. Okay, it's not at all uncommon. We're, we have a chairs area of our ER where we kind of put the overflow, and if somebody's a COPD or and they get stuck over there and kind of ignored, sometimes what can happen is they get CO2 retention and they slide right out of the chair onto the floor. That's how they get a bed in our place. Just pick them up on the floor, stick them in a bed. But they, they can get hypercarbic respiratory failure. So two versions of it. Either you can't blow off the CO2 enough for whatever reason, or you're making too much, or I can't oxygenate. Those are the two reasons that people get respiratory failure. Now, Depending on which of those two it is, I have some options on what to do. For hypercarbic respiratory failure, that is the COPD, -er, the obstructive sleep apnea patient, um, that's mainly the two big ones for those. Um, Non-invasive ventilation is magical. Magical, magical, magical. And I highly recommend if you haven't done it sometime, pull the curtains in your ER, take your non-invasive ventilation machine and put it on yourself. Because it's worth a try to see what it's like. You can, it gives you an idea of why you have to coach people through when you put them on non-invasive ventilation and how to do it, how to help them coordinate with it. But I'll tell you, for COPD, it's considered one of the first line interventions. For obstructive sleep apnea, it can prevent disasters when people fall, fall asleep. Wonderful for that. For congestive heart failure exacerbations, it is the way to go up front if they're bad. And I'll tell you, the other time to consider non-invasive ventilation, which I am a huge proponent of these days, is palliative care. End-of-life care and palliative care. People who don't want to be intubated, of course not, if you don't want to be intubated. But you know, I have a tweener thing here that I can do that may help you feel better breathing, and sometimes it gets them over what would have killed them today so that they can live to tomorrow, the next day, or next week, or next month. So it's something to consider in those groups of patients. But not infrequently, especially for hypoxic respiratory failure, short, anything other than congestive heart failure, acute decompensated CHF. For truly hypoxic respiratory failure, it's not at all uncommon to have to go ahead and intubate. because so we just have to get oxygen delivery our way if you need to. Now, as far as all the obstructive lung diseases, these get, will, will get talked about sort of asthma, COPD, will get talked about in a separate lecture, so I'm not going to dwell on that. What I get to talk about is the fun thing like, ooh, acute bronchitis. Acute bronchitis, the reality is there is no definition that everyone agrees on on what is acute bronchitis, probably because we all use it as a garbage bag. We all use it as sort of a default diagnosis to give an itis diagnosis to someone so that we can feel okay giving antibiotics or they can feel like they really need antibiotics. This is so commonly, it is one of the top 10 reasons that people seek medical care in the United States. It's remarkable. It's extraordinarily common, this acute bronchitis. And what it does for most people when they get sick is that they get some drugs and they get off 